good afternoon, somewhere in between. My name is Rich. I am a member of Living Hope Church here in Athens and uh, a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He's my Savior. Jesus Christ is uh, the great I am. Jesus Christ is the creator, right? Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus Christ is the, the creator of everything in, in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ is the first and the last. He's the, the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the Anointed One, God's Anointed Son. Jesus Christ is the God-Man. Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. And Jesus is the one that God has identified and appointed to be the king of his eternal kingdom, a kingdom that will never pass away. So this is great news today that we bring here to Athens. Great news of the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And it is very much that. The gospel is very much good news. It is the good news that God, the Almighty God, God the Eternal King is in the business of redeeming sinners like you and me. God is in the business of calling people to Himself and forgiving their sins when they turn and trust in Christ, forgiving their sins, washing sins away. The Eternal God is in the business of making all things new in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ, my friends, is in the business of making people a new creation. Isn't that what we need, right? That's exactly what we need, isn't it? We need to be made uh, new creations. And this is possible, my friends, not through psychology or not through modern psychology, not through any humanistic program, not through any self-improvement program, right? But getting a new heart, a heart that loves God, a heart that receives the things of God, a heart that rejoices in the name of Christ, a heart that uh, desires righteousness, a heart that loves the things that God loves and hates the things that God hates, hates sin. My friends, that's a work of God, that's a supernatural work that is only accomplished by the Holy Spirit of God. So I want to do a little bit of reading today. I hope you all, by the way, I hope you're enjoying your day. Uh, they were calling for rain, but uh, we looked we looked on the weather forecast a little bit ago, and that seems to have dissipated. So we should be in for some great weather here today in Athens. So we welcome you. We welcome you here today. We welcome you to this city. We welcome you. We greet you uh, today, not in the name of Georgia football. It's fine to watch a football game. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with uh, enjoying football. But we welcome you not in the name of football, but we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I'm wearing a shirt that I dug out of my closet. I haven't seen it for about two years. I bought it from a friend a couple years ago who was in full-time ministry. And it has a saying on it says, Every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. And so I thought I would talk a little bit today about where the Bible, the New Testament, uh, where, this, where this phrase comes from. And the phrase comes from a book written by the Apostle Paul called the book of Philippians. Uh, as is the case with most of the epistles in the New Testament, the name, uh, the name comes from the city, right? Comes from the city where the church was that Paul sends the letter to. And so the letter to the Philippians, appropriately enough, was sent to uh, the young church there in Philippi. So just to give you a little bit of history, a little bit of background, Jesus was born, Jesus of Nazareth was born somewhere around uh, the year zero. You ever thought about that? That's in fact why. That's why we date our calendars, right? We say it's the year 2021. Well, 2021 what? Well, it's been 2,021 years, right, since Jesus of Nazareth was born. 
and today we date our very calendars, right, by uh, the physical life, the life on this earth of Jesus of Nazareth. That's how important Jesus was. So Jesus is born somewhere around the year zero, right, the year zero, where B.C. becomes A.D., right, that's when Jesus is born. He lives uh, for 33 years. Jesus lives a life on this earth for, for 33 years. Um, he's born as the son of Mary, and his legal father was Joseph. And Jesus lived a perfect life. That's the important thing as far as the gospel is concerned. It's important who he is, and the Bible identifies Jesus Christ as being the eternal word. In other words, Jesus, in the form of God, existed for, from eternity past. You ever thought about that? You see, your psychology professor hasn't uh, existed from eternity past, has he? Charles Darwin hasn't existed from eternity past. Um, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha did not exist from eternity past, did he? You ever thought about that before? Muhammad has not existed from eternity past, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the eternal Word of God, Jesus Christ, has existed from eternity past. In other words, there was never a time when the Son of God did not exist. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the Word of God, is uh, co-eternal with the Father. The word we would use there, the word we would use there is co-eternal. Jesus is co-eternal with God the Father. Okay. So in other words, there was no time in which Jesus did not exist. He's always existed. He always will exist. And in fact, it's logically impossible, it's logically impossible that God does not exist. It's logically impossible that the Son of God has not always existed. So he's always existed, okay? Um, probably about 10,000 years ago, right? God created the heavens and the earth, give or take, a, a few thousand years. Um, and then about 2,000 years ago, about 2,000 years ago, uh, the Son of God, the eternal God, enfleshes himself, comes to live on this planet. He comes to take on flesh. The eternal God marries himself to a human body, a body like you and I have. It says this in Romans chapter 8, that, that God gave Jesus a body like the body that we sinners have. But understand this, my friends, Jesus did not cease to be God. Jesus was fully God. He was truly God. He was not a demigod. He was not a half-God. Jesus Christ, every moment of his earthly existence, he was fully God. He was truly God, and he was truly man. Jesus Christ had two natures. You and I have one nature. We have a human nature, right? There are maybe a few thousand people here in the surrounding area today. Okay, a few thousand human beings, but guess what? We have one nature. Each of us has a human nature. You understand that? Well, Jesus of Nazareth had a human nature, just like uh, the nature you and I have, but that was not it. He was also fully and truly God. He had two natures in one person, in one being. So Jesus Christ is the God-man. He is fully God, truly God, and truly man. So Jesus lives on this earth for 33 years, and he lives a perfect life. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that Jesus lived a perfect life? Well, it means that Jesus never did anything that broke God's law. Jesus was never one to break the law of God. He perfectly kept the law of God in thought. Every thought that Jesus had was consistent with the desires of God. Every action that Jesus performed, every deed that Jesus did, was perfectly consistent with what God himself would do. And every word that Jesus spoke always honored God, always respected God, always glorified God. 
And so I want you to think for a second, you know, a lot of times uh, street preachers, I guess you could refer to me as that right now. It's one of many hats that I wear. You know, we, we kind of get caricatured and people are like, well, the street preachers just come out to point their finger at people and tell them that they're going to hell and they're doing everything wrong. Well, my friends, I, I want to just be clear about this. We don't come out to point our finger and say, we're good and you're bad. That, that could, nothing could be further from our message than that. Um, the message of the scripture is a universal message, right? Um, the scripture teaches that all have sinned. That every human being, every mere human being, uh, everyone that has a mere human nature has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And certainly this applies to me. I would say, first and foremost, I want to be clear about that, first and foremost this applies to me. I'm more familiar with my own sins. I'm more in touch with my own shortcomings uh, in thought, in word, and in deed than I am anyone else's. But see, my friends, you've got to understand that that applies to you too, right? That it applies to each one of us. That, that there is no one out here that outside of the blood of Jesus, apart from the blood of Jesus, God would not look at any person out here and say, that's a good person. You understand that? Because according to God's law, we're all lawbreakers. You know, my brother was sharing a verse earlier um, from Revelation. And it says in Revelation chapter 20 or 21, I forget which one, but there towards the end of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it says this, it says that all liars, right? Think about this, uh, think about this claim for a second. The Bible says that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. And so right away, you gotta think, well, that's a problem for people like me and people like you, if you're honest with yourself, because why? Because all of us have lied, right? Can, can anybody out here honestly claim that you've never told a lie all of your life? And if we're honest with ourselves, we would say uh, big lies and small lies. Uh, we've, we've all done that hundreds of times, thousands of times, maybe with some of us millions of times. So let's just say that you uh, are a really honest person by human standards and say, so... Uh, you're, you're far more honest than most human beings, and so in your life, you've only lied 1,000 times. Most people have lied hundreds of thousands of times, but let's say you're an exceptionally honest person, and so you've only told 1,000 lies, nearly 1,000 in your entire life. Well, let me ask you a question. What do we call, what would you call a person, right? What, what is the title or the name uh, that you would give to a person who has told 1,000 lies. You'd say, well, a person who told 1,000 lies is a, a liar, right? Okay, well, see, right there we've got a problem because even the most honest human beings that we know, according to God's standards, they're liars. They're guilty of deceiving. Deceiving others, trying to deceive God, deceiving themselves. And consequently, um, according to Revelation 21, it says that all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. The Bible has strong words, my friends. It doesn't get much stronger than that, does it? You know, so, so often it's the case that people think, well, street preachers come out and they preach against drunkenness, which we do. Uh, they come out, they preach against sexual immorality, which we do. They preach against pornography, which we do. They preach against the, the uh, committing homosexual acts, which we do. But my friends, I want you to understand that the problem is much more general than that. I hope you understand that today because the Bible says things like dishonesty, things like lying, which we all do, are very serious sins before a holy God. Dishonesty in and of itself is enough, right? If a person uh, lives his or her, her whole life without experiencing forgiveness through Christ, just being but the act of being a dishonest person alone is enough to separate you from God forever. Do you see that? Also things like jealousy, right? Jealousy. We don't think of jealousy as be, being a big sin, but the scripture talks very clearly about that. It says that this is a work of the flesh. It leads to destruction, right? 
It leads to enmity with God. It leads to separation. Being a jealous person, being uh, an envious person, being a person that covets, that's a big sin before God. Because coveting, if you think about it, is saying, I want someone else's stuff. God hasn't given me enough. God hasn't provided what I really need. And so we would say, well, coveting, that's not a big sin, right? That's not like a, it's like you're out, out killing people. It's not like you're a pedophile. It's not like you're a child pornographer. But my friends, coveting is a very serious sin before God. So we have these things like lying, like jealousy, like coveting, like enmity, um, like gossip. How many of you could say that you, honestly that, that you have never gossiped about a person? Well, my friends, gossiping and backbiting... That's a huge sin before God. That's a work of the flesh. It leads to eternal uh, destruction. So, you know, we have to have a proper understanding, my friends, of just how holy God is. How morally perfect God is. How God is perfect in, in all of His ways, all of His attributes. God is the paragon of... He's the highest standard. He's the defining standard of justice, right? There's a lot of talk about social justice today. Well, let me tell you, my friends, true justice uh, is anchored in the attributes and characteristics of God. If you did not have a God who was the very standard of justice, perfect justice, then human justice would have no value, would have no reference point. So God is he's holy, holy, holy. He is, he is in a category of His own. God is morally pure. God is upright. God is perfectly righteous. The Bible says that God is not a God uh, who can co-dwell. God cannot uh, live together with sin, right? If you take a class in chemistry at the University of Georgia, they'll talk about um, two substances being immiscible. Maybe you've heard that word, maybe you haven't. The word immiscible. Well, what does it mean to say that two things are immiscible? Right? Immiscible means that you can't mix the two. It's impossible to mix these two things together. And so, my friends, you cannot... Uh, it's, it's literally impossible to mix God's holiness with sin. That, that's not a logical possibility. So God is, he, he uh, people say, well, we ask people, what is God like? We do these little surveys around campus called the Great Exchange Surveys, and they're just uh, ways to start spiritual conversations with people. And one of the questions on there is, do you believe in God? And if so, what is God like? And how do you think, how do you think most people answer that question? If you take the average person on the street, maybe they would claim to be a Christian, maybe they wouldn't. But you ask that person, what is God like? And probably the single most common answer we get is, is a person says that God is love. You know, God, what's God like? Well, well, God is love. God is caring. God is forgiving. Right? And you know what? I actually agree that that is very consistent with what the Bible says. But see, a lot of people want to stop there. In uh, postmodern America, in post-Christian America. You know, America is not so much of a Christian nation anymore. Do you realize that? This tide of secularism has risen very rapidly. And if you don't believe it for yourself, um, speak with people in the younger generation. They're, they're mostly uh, socialized by the Internet. Do you realize that? Uh, generation Z. Most of these college students are Generation Z now. I'm a Generation Xer. Right, I'm a mid-Xer, I was born in 72, then you had Generation Y, the Millennials. Well, the Millennials are like 25 to 42 or something now, and so the younger kids now, the college students, are Generation Z. Uh, Generation Z is uh, digital natives, meaning that from their youngest years, they had an internet device in their hands. And so the biggest factor in them, uh, in shaping, in, in molding, um, their beliefs, their standards, their mores, their values has been uh, things like social media and the internet. You realize that, so that marks a very abrupt change. And so along with that, 
most of their views about God. If there is a God, uh, what is God like? And they'll say, well, God is just a God of love. He accepts everyone unconditionally. God doesn't judge anyone. God just throws his arms open wide. and uh, It's kind of like the cosmic teddy bear, right? Just want to take you, takes you into his arms at the end of the day, give you a big hug, and tell you everything is going to be all right. Well, my friends, let me tell you something. It's, it's your right. It's a free country still, at least for a while. Um, you can believe that if you want, but see, you, you, you won't get that from this book. Okay, That's not the God that you read about in the Christian Bible. And so, one of two things is true, right? Either who this book says describes God to be, what he's like, is true and accurate and is the final word, or what people say, what people say on the internet, what people say they feel, what people say they think, their own subjective impressions are the standard. So, so it has to be one or the other. So people will tell you, well, God is a God of love, He's a lot of gr God of grace, mercy, He just forgives, He accepts everyone. Um, well, some of that is true and some of it's false, my friends. God is a God of love, for sure. You know, most of us know John 3.16, right? John 3.16 says what? It says, for God so loved the world, right? God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him uh, shall not perish, but have eternal life. In 1 John, I think it's chapter 4, it literally says that God is love. We should love one another as Christians. Why? It says, for God is love. And so the very nature of God is one of, of true, uh, unremitting love. Okay? But I would take it beyond that. Here's the question. Is God just love? Is God only love? Or to, to phrase it differently, let's, let's take it from a different angle. Um, is God a God who... Is a God a God who punishes sin? Is God a God who is morally ambivalent? Is God a God who loved and accepted Adolf Hitler regardless of the fact that he murdered six million Jews? Right? Do you see that? So we got to ask that question. Adolf Hitler was a human being. He was a very wicked man. Most of us know who Hitler was. So the question is, if you, if you say... If you say on one hand that God just loves, God just accepts people unconditionally, God embraces people unconditionally, He accepts them for who they are, then you would have to be consistent with that. I hope you see this. To be consistent with that, you would have to conclude that God accepted Adolf Hitler just like, just as he was, right? And I don't honestly, I don't know a lot of people. I'm sure they're out there, but I don't know many people who would support that statement. I don't know a lot of people who would say that God just welcomed Adolf Hitler into heaven uh, despite the fact that he had just uh, murdered six million Jews. I don't know a lot of people that would say that. I don't know a lot of people that would say that uh, Ted Bundy, the serial killer, was welcomed, it was accepted by God just as he is, right? I don't, I don't see that. I don't know a lot of people that would say uh, people who, uh, who kidnap kids and sell them into human trafficking, right? Sex trafficking. I, I don't know many people that would say that that God just accepts those people for who they are. So, so we would recognize, what well, my point is this, we would recognize that God does have certain standards, right? Because He is love, because God is love, He hates child abuse. Because God is love, He hates murder. Because God is love, He hates genocide. Do you see that? So the, the fact that God is love has implications for God's moral standards. I hope you see that today. So God is not morally ambivalent. God does have moral standards that he expects his human creatures uh, to abide by. And so, so we do these surveys. People say, well, God is love. Okay, then let me ask you this. If you claim to be a Christian, because this is really... I know a lot of people out here today would claim to be Christians, right? A lot of people would claim to be Christians. They would say, you know, I grew up in the church. I said the sinner's prayer. I asked Jesus into my heart. Maybe you were water baptized. Maybe your family is members at a church. Maybe you have a relative that's a pastor. All very common things in the South. Um, but, you know, I, I hear people who give me those answers, but at the same time, they'll turn around and tell me that God accepts people unconditionally. My friends, do, do you understand that that statement, uh, God accepts everyone unconditionally, 
is absolutely antithetical. You cannot get a more opposite statement than that to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So, so my friends, you got to understand God. The fact that God sent His Son into the world to to suffer and bleed and die on the cross is the the greatest statement ever, right? That God takes sin very seriously. Do you see that? God takes sin very seriously. Jesus did not die by accident. He lived a perfect life, and then guess what? He was arrested. He gave himself over to be arrested. Jesus was not captured against his will. The Bible is very clear about this. Jesus could have spoke one word, and God would have sent 10,000 angels. We tend to think of angels as these little babies naked with wings flying around on the clouds. My friends, that's not what a, an angel is in the Bible. Anytime an angel of God appeared to a human being, the, the person, the, the, the angel was so glorious, the angel was so powerful, the angel of God, a created creature, was so majestic that people were tempted to bow and worship the angel. They cringed in fear at the power of an angel, of one angel. And Jesus said that he did not have to die on the cross if he, if he wasn't willing to be crucified, if he did not will, willingly lay down his life. He said this, he said, I could speak and my father would send 10,000 angels. My friends, that would be like 10,000 nuclear bombs. You understand that? One angel alone could have destroyed all of the legions of Roman soldiers. One angel alone could have eradicated all of those soldiers. One angel of God alone would have been enough to, to overthrow any human power. Jesus said, I could speak to my Father and He would send 10,000 angels to rescue me. But what does Jesus do, my friends? He gives Himself over to be bound. Jesus gives Himself over. Jesus makes Himself available. He lays down His life. Jesus allows Himself to be arrested. Jesus allows Himself to be scourged with the cat of nine tails. Jesus allows himself to be mocked. He allows the soldiers to blindfold him and spit on him and slap him and, and punch him. Jesus allows, he bears that beam of the cross up the Via Dolorosa to Golgotha where he's nailed to the cross, my friends. It didn't have to, it, it didn't have to be that way, but Jesus knew that that was the only way the only way that you and I, sinners like you and me, could ever be forgiven. That sinners like you and me could ever, that, that, that a God who is perfectly just, a God who is infinitely righteous, could ever look upon a sinner like me, could ever look upon a sinner like you, and, and declare that person to be righteous, to, to declare that person to be forgiven. The only way for that to happen was Jesus sacrificial in a substitutionary death on the cross. So uh, what I'm trying to do here is push back against this notion that God loves and accepts everyone unconditionally. Clearly that's not true. Now it is very much true that God accepts and forgives and receives all manner of sinners. I was a very immoral person, very dishonest, sexually immoral, very proud, very angry person. You go down the list very a very guilty sinner uh, but God forgave me God forgives thieves my friends do you understand that how many thieves how many people that have gone and let's say served uh, prison sentences for larceny for embezzlement for armed robbery that Jesus Christ has intercepted and he's forgiven their sins he's made them new creations Jesus receives people like that Jesus receives sexually immoral people he, re he receives people who have committed adultery. They've cheated on their spouses. Jesus can forgive that, and he does forgive that. Jesus forgives fornicators, people who have sex outside of marriage, right? That's a very... Now, today's society, today's culture says, that's not a big deal. Cohabitation is the norm. It's the standard, right? Even people in the church, even people in many churches have become okay with that. God says that's a, that's a big sin. God says that he will judge adulterers and fornicators but the good news my friends is that Jesus forgives fornicators if you repent of that 
And repentance means you turn from that way of life and you uh, place your faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ forgives uh, homosexuals. You know, this is a big conversation in our culture. It's easy to get this wrong one way, one side or the other. Uh, the most popular response by far, there's an enormous social pressure to, uh, even for Christian churches, even for Christian people, to, uh, to bow in an unqualified sense before this LGBTQ uh, sexual moral revolution. And, you know, Christians get caricatured all the time. People say, well, you Christians, you just hate gay people. My friends, nothing's further from the truth, okay? It has nothing to do with hating. I don't hate liars, but I tell them, hey, you got to stop lying. I don't hate drunkards, but we tell them, hey, you got to stop being a drunkard. We don't hate thieves, but we say you got to stop stealing. You see that? We, we don't hate people that smoke crack cocaine, but we tell them you got to stop smoking crack if you want to follow Jesus. And by the same token, my friends, uh, we, we don't hate gay people. We don't ha hate people who are transgender, right? We love them, and that's why we tell them you've got to turn uh, from that lifestyle and you can find real hope and forgiveness uh, and restoration in Jesus Christ. But see, our culture, my friends, wants to say that, that God accepts everyone unconditionally. The gospel, in fact, the cross of Jesus Christ itself, is the definitive, eternal statement by God that God accepts people only through the perfect, redemptive work uh, that was completed by Jesus Christ as he suffered and bled and died on that cross. As Jesus Christ drank down, the Bible says, undiluted, Jesus drank down the, the cup of God's wrath. So there is a cup of God's wrath. We were talking to some students downtown last night, and this young man, I think he was a college student here at UGA, he says, well, you know, have you ever heard of the Orthodox faith? And by the way, I, I don't claim to be giving a definitive statement on what the Orthodox believe. I don't know. Um, I was a former atheist who's now a Christian. Um, but he says, do you know what the Orthodox believe? And I said, no, I don't know what the Orthodox believe. He says, well, the Orthodox don't believe in this God of wrath. They don't believe in this God of anger. And so we started challenging him, my brother Alex mainly, saying, well, let's, you know, let's open up the, the, the Bible. Well, let's see what the Bible says. It doesn't really matter what a particular... Uh, tradition, religious tradition says, it doesn't matter what a council of fallible men says, um, the, the only relevant question should be, what does the Word of God say? Does the Word of God use terms like the wrath of God? Does it talk about the cup of God's wrath? You know, if not, if the Word of God doesn't say that, then that's the last thing I want to talk about. But my friends, the reverse is also true. If this Bible says that there is a cup of God's wrath, if it says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against humans that suppress the truth and unrighteousness, my friends, then that's certainly a message that the church needs to keep. We can't just jettison that. We can't just get rid of that because the culture around us says uh, that's we don't like that. We don't like that message. Well, uh, newsflash. Humans have not liked the gospel of Jesus Christ for the last 2,000 years. Have you thought about that before? There's a reason why people crucified Jesus. That's because a lot of people, guess what? A lot of people, I would, I would venture to say most people at the time, hated Jesus' message. Have you thought about that before? People think about Jesus today. People say, well, uh, oh, I believe what Mahatma Gandhi said. Gandhi said, you're Christ I love. You're Christ I like. It's your Christians that I don't like because they're so unlike your Christ. Well, my friends, if Jesus had appeared during Mahatma Gandhi's day, Gandhi would have rejected Jesus in the flesh. Do you understand that? Like most people did. In the words of Christ himself, he says, this is the judgment, John chapter 3. Just a few verses after John 3.16, Jesus says this. He says, this is the judgment. Another translation says, this is the verdict. But what is the verdict? These are the words of Jesus, not the words of a street preacher, not the words of a pastor, the words of Jesus Christ himself. He says, this is the judgment, this is the verdict that, that light has come into the world. Talking about himself. Light has come into the world. And then what does he say after that? He says, and people have loved the light because they're pretty good people. That's not what he says, my friends. Jesus says, 
This is the verdict. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. But what did people do? People hated the light. He didn't say they ignored the light. He, said, he didn't say they were indifferent towards the light. He didn't say they shrugged off the light. He says light, truth. God's perfect goodness has come into the world. Right? And people hated that. They hated the light. They hated the light. They, they raged against the light. They mocked the light. They ridiculed the light. They nailed the light to a cross. Why? Because their deeds were evil. They loved their sin. They hate the light. They love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds are evil. And see, my friends, what we're trying to do here, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which, thank God, there are still some good churches. There's still some good churches in this area that do uh, preach the gospel. Um, but they're becoming fewer and fewer, my friends. Even much of Christianity today has become um, this basically a, a, a therapeutic session. Here's a six-lesson series on Sunday morning about how to, how to have more financial success, how to get along better with your co-workers, how to get people to like you, how to live out your legacy. You know, people flock to messages like that, right? To how you can fulfill your legacy and build your empire and be upwardly mobile and have financial success and have health and have fame. My friends, the gospel is not concerned with any of those things. Do you understand that? The, the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about, first and foremost, number one, number one, who God is. And, and guess what? The gospel puts, puts God way, way, way up there. Like, like God is as highly exalted as you could possibly imagine. God is eternally transcendent in all of his ways. And you and I, as sinful wretches, are way down here, my friends. You see that? The true gospel, the way that the, the Bible portrays God, he's way up here, you and I are way down here, and there's this infinite chasm, this infinite gulf that separates sinners like you and me from a God who is thrice holy. Do you, do you see that? So unless you understand that, unless your church preaches that, unless your church, they might not use those exact words, But unless those concepts are being taught and preached, my friends, you're not getting you're not getting the actual gospel of Jesus Christ. Because what the, the you know the, the popular notion today is that you know yeah humans are broken right we hear that all the time we live in a broken world which is true by the way but it's not our biggest problem the biggest problem is we're rebels and we love our sin. But it is true we live in a broken world. People are live in a broken world. We're broken people. And yet Jesus was a pretty cool dude. And so, like, if you get a little Jesus in your life, if uh, you, you adopt this Jesus as my boyfriend, you start singing these songs about how Jesus is your best friend and he's your boyfriend and all this and that, then somehow your life will get a little bit better. My friends, that has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you, do you see that? The gospel of Jesus Christ is about the unmitigated majesty of God. The perfect majesty of God. And the perfect wretchedness, the depravity of sinners like you and me. Sinners who are without hope. We don't stand a chance, my friends. No religious program we can initiate. No um, life of self-denial. No pattern of good works. No um, amount of almsgiving, giving money to the poor can save you. And most people think that they're pretty good people. And you know, you can get away with that when you're making horizontal comparisons, when you're just comparing yourself to other sinful wretches, right? 
guess what? If they took any one of you and put you on death row, you looked around you, you'd probably feel like, well, I'm a pretty good person, right? I haven't done what these people do. But see, my friends, that's not your comparison. That's not the basis of your judgment on the day when Jesus Christ judges the world in righteousness. The standard is God's uncompromising standard of perfection. And so all of a sudden, this becomes a huge deal. This becomes a huge problem that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, doesn't it? Because guess what? If you fall short of the glory of God, and unless God does something about that, that lands you squarely into hell for all of eternity. Hell's going to be filled with people who thought they were pretty good people. Do you realize that? I'll say it again. It's really important that you get that because so many people in our culture and society today are convinced that they're pretty good people and consequently they don't need the Jesus of the Bible. Hell is going to be filled with people who thought they were pretty good people. Hell is going to be filled with people who helped the old lady across the street rake her, la uh, rake her leaves in the fall. Do, do you see that? Hell is going to be filled with people who gave money to the poor. Hell is going to be filled with people who were member on membership roles of churches. Hell is going to be filled uh, with people who preached from pulpits. It's going to have people in it who preached on the streets. Hell is going to be filled with people who were um, nieces and nephews or sons and daughters or grandchildren of Southern Baptist pastors. Hell is going to be filled with people who said the magical sinner's prayer to invite Jesus into their heart. Did you understand that? There, there's going to be millions of Baptists in hell. There's going to be all kinds of Episcopalians in hell. There's going to be lots of members of the Churches of Christ in hell. Do you understand that? There's going to be a lot of Methodists in hell. There's going to be a lot of Roman Catholics in hell, my friends. Religion does not save you. Inheriting a faith for tradition from your parents or grandparents or whoever doesn't save you. Saying, reciting, rotely reciting, and even intellectually agreeing with something like the sinner's prayer, which by the way, you don't find that in the Bible, but that is not going to save you, my friends. The question is this, have you been born again? There was a time in my life I left atheism. I was a very vocal atheist. I was a professor here at the University of Georgia, and for two years I led the atheist club on this campus, okay? And then I went through a period of my life where I truly believed in my head I came to believe in my head that Jesus really was the Son of God. I came to believe that in my head, but guess what? My heart had not been regenerated. There's a lot of people out there like that, my friends, who believe these things intellectually to be true about Jesus. Yes, Jesus was the Son of God. Yes, Jesus was crucified. Yes, he died for sinners. Yes, he was buried. Yes, he was raised again on the third day. But my friends, they've not been born again from above. They've not, not been born again by the Holy Spirit of God. And you can tell this because there's no real desire in their life to live as a new creation. I'm not talking about being perfect. No, nobody on this earth achieves sinful, per, uh, sin, sinless perfection this side of the grave. That's impossible. But Christ does sanctify His people. The Holy Spirit does come to live inside, to indwell a believer. In fact, that's what it means to be born again. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit himself comes to take up residence inside of your innermost being. And because of that, you start hating sin. Because of that, you start wanting to get the sin out of your life. Because of that, you keep pursuing the things of God. Imperfectly, but you keep going in that direction. The Bible calls that the fruit of the Spirit, right? It says this in Galatians um, chapter 5. Is it 5 or 6, Alex? Galatians chapter 5. It says the, the fruit of the Spirit, right? It talks about the works of the flesh. Let me get my Bible. This is an important section. We'll go ahead and read this because we're going to make a contrast here. Paul is making a contrast here in the book of Galatians. And so before we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, I want to give you the context because he talks about the, wor the, the works of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh, if you will, the fruit of the flesh. And so I, if you claim to be a Christian today, I, I want to invite you to do a little bit of inventory. I want you to, to take an honest inventory, do some introspection, and ask yourself, um, which of these two ways is more descriptive of my life? 
because that should be diagnostic. And Paul says this, he says, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, he says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. The works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, things like fornication, things like pornography, things like homosexuality, things like transgenderism. The works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral uh, impurity, promiscuity. What's promiscuity? That means that you're sexually active with multiple people or at least lusting after different people. Idolatry, an idol is anything in your life that is more important to you than God. A lot of people have the idol of money. A lot of people have the idol of social status. A lot of people have the idol of sports. A lot of people have the idol of uh, their country club membership. Idolatry, sorcery, uh, sorcery is, uh, it, it's, it's tapping in using things like, you know, like Ouija boards, that would be a type of sorcery, tarot cards, those types of things. But listen, it's not just that, those are some real obvious ones. The works of the flesh are also hatreds, living at, with animosity towards people. The works of, the works of the flesh are hatreds, are strife. You have a lot of strife with people. Jealousy. Are you a jealous person? That's a work of the flesh, Paul says. Outbursts of anger. There's a lot of angry people in our culture. I've noticed this driving around. Road rage has been a problem for 20 years or so. It's gotten really bad here in the last year or so. People are more rude than ever. The outbursts of anger are more than ever. You look at the rioting and looting on the streets. You know, people do it in the name of a social movement, but really it's not about that. They're just angry. They're discontent. They're unsettled. They're jealous. Hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions. Are you a person driven by selfish ambitions? If so, according to the Bible, that's a work of the flesh. Dissensions, people not getting along, people being constantly divided. Factions, envy, envy wanting other people's stuff. Drunkenness, carousing and anything similar. And then Paul says this, he says, this is the Holy Spirit of God speaking through the Apostle Paul. He says, I tell you about these things in advance, as I told you before, he says, that those who practice, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you see that? So it's not just the big sins. It is the big sins, but it's also things you and I think of as little sins. Sins of the heart. Sins of our pride. Sins of our attitude. Sins of our ego. He says people who live those kinds of life, who practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you claim to be a Christian, but a lot of those, not all of them, but if you locked in on a few of them and say, honestly, I live like that a lot, well, hang on, let me read the rest. He says, verse 22. So... All of that was about living in the flesh. Now, what about a person who's truly been born again? What about a person who truly has the Holy Spirit of God in their heart? He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's kindness. It's goodness. It's faith. Gentleness. Self-control. I'll read the list again. It's a great list. I think there are nine items on there. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Not just, oh, uh, you love, 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 love is love. No, love is really caring about the welfare of the other person. Even if that costs you something. Even if that makes you unpopular. Even if that puts you in a position where you have to speak unpopular truths to the person. Fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy. Do you have joy in your life? Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Then he says this, kind of summing it all up, Paul says in verse 24, he says, now those who belong to Christ Jesus, here's how you can tell, right? You have a quote, you, you profess to be a Christian, here's, here's the litmus test, here's the barometer. You profess to be a Christian, here's the barometer. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. They've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Is that true of you? Is it true that you've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires? And he says, since we Christians, we who have been born again, live by the Spirit, we must also follow the Spirit. So that's my question. I'll end with that today. My brother Alex is going to preach. 
leading us into game time. But my question to you is, if you were accused today, you profess to be a Christian, a lot of people do in the South, what evidence does the external observer have in your life? Would there be enough evidence? What about the people who know you the best? What about your spouse? I'm not saying, can you put on a good face on Sunday morning? That's not hard to do. I did that when I was a fake Christian. It's not hard to do. Smile, sing the songs, flap your hands around, you know. Woo, Jesus, woo! You know, it's not hard to do that. What about the people that know you the best? Would they say that the fruit of the Spirit abounds in your life? Would they? What about your siblings? What about your brothers and sisters? What about your parents? Is the love of the Spirit abounding in your life? Or are there more works of the flesh that are evident in your life? My friends, we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's absolutely true. But we're not saved. No one is saved by a dead faith, my friends. There's a world of difference between a living faith, a salvific faith, a faith that is true and genuine. There's a world of difference between that and a person who has the religion of Christianity. Anybody can claim to be a Christian. You know, there are some very wicked people. I won't name anybody by name. Uh, but in Washington, D.C. today, who are in the executive branch of our government, who claim to be Christians, my friends, but there's no evidence in their life that they're actually, they love Jesus. They support baby murder. They're okay with a million babies being killed through abortion every year in the United States, my friends. No Christian believes that. No Christian is okay with a million babies being murdered every year legally in the United States. So by the fruit of their life, they prove that they're not born again. They're not genuine followers of Jesus Christ. So what about you? What's the evidence in your life? You profess the name of Christ. What is the evidence that you've been born again by the Holy Spirit? And if you find that evidence lacking, my friends, well, come up. We can pray about that. We can look in the Bible. You can ask me anything you want. I don't come out to monologue. I would love to dialogue. So would my brother Alex after he's done preaching. Ask us whatever you would like to ask. We're here because we care. We'll search the scriptures together, my friends. Maybe you're here today and you've never, uh, you've never realized just how much you need Christ. You thought being a pretty good person was enough. You agree with most Americans who are wrong about this and they think, you know, God accepts every person who's a pretty good person into heaven. And you realize for the first time today that you're a sinner that's a billion miles away from the holiness of God. And except for the saving work of Jesus Christ, my friends, you have no hope on the day that God judges the world. Well, if that's true, my friends, let me encourage you today. You could be the greatest sinner out here. Really, it's kind of inconsequential. Um, what is the posture of your heart? The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you want to encounter Jesus Christ for the first time in a saving way, humble yourself before God. Come humbly to the foot of the cross. In your heart. You don't have to repeat a prayer. Just just in your the own attitude of your heart. Acknowledge that you have no hope outside of Christ, but Christ was that perfect sacrifice on the cross for your sins. It says in Romans chapter 10 that if you use your mouth to confess that Jesus is Lord, and in, in your heart you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, that you shall be saved. There's no sinner out here who's too far away today, my friends. I don't care what your past is like. I don't care. Maybe you've been a fake Christian. Maybe you've been a so-called atheist. Maybe you're a person of a different faith. Maybe you haven't cared. Maybe you're an apatheist, right? But if you look upon the cross of Jesus Christ with a pure heart today, with a new heart that the Lord himself gives you, my friends, you. then you shall be saved. So God bless you. Hope you enjoy your afternoon. I'll be hanging around here with Alex for a while. If you have any questions, you need prayer, let me know. We would love to do that.